Welcome, everyone, to another one of our amazing, exciting, fantastic shows. Uh, this one on Know the Cosmos is called Conversations with an Astrophysicist. I am your host, Scott Lewis, and with me, as always, our resident astrophysicist is Katie Mack from Melbourne, Australia. How are you doing, Katie? Good, good. How are you doing? Good. Uh, it's It rained in Los Angeles. Oh, my yeah. God. Yay! I think it's still raining right now, so I'm happy about that. Good. It's That's very... good. Um, it's been it's been like stormy and windy and crazy out here in Melbourne. Um, really? It's still right now, but lots of wind, very dramatic. Very well, you know, summer's coming, so. Yes. Summer is coming. So, <laughs> so, so this is part two. Um, we did have a brief little hiatus because somebody had a birthday, and I went and celebrated that, um, which was awesome. The lack of dedication is very disappointing. I'm sorry, but hey, I got the best birthday oh my gosh. present in the world. Wow. Is this not adorable? This is that from is um, my friend Bill Carter's four-year-old daughter, Zoe. So there's Zoe. And yeah. Scott. this is our, our wooden space shuttle. And this is, like, the best birthday present ever. So here's to you, Zoe. Thank you. Um, I didn't really get to meet you too much because you were sleeping when you showed up at the party. But, um, again, thank you for, the, like, this amazing birthday present that I keep on my desk now uh, whenever I need a smile. So, anyway, back to, uh, back to topic. This is our second in this series about the cosmic microwave background. So what we're going to do first yes. is we're going to do a quick little overview of what we've talked about uh, to, to catch everyone up, and uh, then move on forward to heavier, deeper things. So what you know, first of all, I guess let's let's touch base on what is the CMB. What is the cosmic microwave background? Right. So the cosmic microwave background is. The, it's basically the leftover light from the Big Bang. And uh, if, you, if you've ever talked to a cosmologist about the Big Bang, you know that the Big Bang is not... Like, when we talk about the Big Bang, we're not talking about, like, the singularity from which everything formed. That, that right. doesn't necessarily come into it. What the Big Bang is is the idea that in the past, in the very distant past, uh, the universe was hot and dense and, um, and smaller than it is today. Yes, yeah, just so, don't bring and, up that song because I will get angry. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a there is a popular TV show. Oh in which, no! In which the beginning of the theme song has actually a reasonably good explanation of the Big Bang, which is really it's really just that the the universe is hot and dense, and and right. it's been expanding, it's been getting bigger since then. Um, and so this period of time, um, uh, something like. Uh, 13 billion years ago um, was known as the hot Big Bang, and because it was because the the this was a, a period of time when the universe was hot and dense, um, it glowed basically with radiation, and it produced this radiation that is is still traveling throughout the universe. Right. And so because when we look far away, we're looking into the past because light takes time to get to us. If you look farther far enough away you're seeing this Big Bang radiation. Right. Um, you're seeing the glow from this sort of primordial fireball state. And um, that radiation was emitted at the time when this fireball was just starting to cool off. Uh, I mean, I say fireball, it's not a ball, it's just the whole universe was in this Right, this everything, because space has been everything. expanding. Everything yeah. has been expanding, right. Yeah, yeah. And so as the universe expanded, this, this light was able to travel freely through the universe, and as it travels, it gets stretched out by the expansion of space, and so it started out at sort of um, higher frequencies, it started out at, as, as hotter radiation, and now it's in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Right. So what we see is, if we look at the sky with microwave telescopes, we see Oops. that um, every part of the sky, every direction is glowing with this little bit of microwave radiation, and that's called the cosmic microwave background. And it's... Do you mean it's really, this by any chance? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like that. Um, it's all at the same temperature. It's all at roughly the same temperature. So it's all at about 
2.73 kelvins, which is very close to absolute zero. Right. Um, zero kelvins is negative 273 Celsius. Um, and so it's this just tiny little bit of radiation, but it's coming to us from the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And there are little tiny fluctuations in that, in that radiation as you look at slight, sort of different directions in the sky. Um, and I guess that's what we're going to talk about today, those, those fluctuations in the microwave background and what we can learn from that. So be, before we, we get fully into it, I, I do want to make sure everybody knows on how you can uh, be in touch with us now that we are live. I'm already seeing a couple questions pop up here. So we do have the Q&A app enabled on Google Plus and YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, it'll be on the bottom left little corner. You can click it. pops open this great interface where you can ask us questions. Uh, you can leave us comments on YouTube as well. And we are on Twitter. We are, like, all over the Twitter. So I am Scientific Scott down here, and Katie is at Astro, Astro Katie, Katie down yeah. there. And um, and also the the main thing of our show uh, is also Know the Cosmos. So you can tweet us at, at Know the Cosmos. And we will try to answer those questions as they come along. So yes. fluctuations. What what's going on here? I mean, we we talked a little bit yeah. last time about how these fluctuations, which you know, if you just look at the the CMB there, you're seeing oh, there's blue and red. It looks like it must be a lot, but we talked about that is very 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 small fluctuations. Yeah. What are, what are we looking at when we're talking about those fluctuations? Yeah. So when we look at the cosmomicrobe background in terms of just the radiations coming to us. Um, you can measure a temperature by looking at basically the frequency of the light that's coming to you. Um, mm -hmm. Something that's hotter um, gives off light at a higher frequency. Something that's colder gives off light at a lower frequency. Um, just in the same way that a blue hot flame is, is hotter than a red hot flame. Um, right. And so the when we look at the, at the background, we see everything is basically at 2.73 Kelvin. But there are little tiny fluctuations on that at, in, in like one part in 100,000 um, fluctuations on that temperature, and so we can we can map that out, and we can show we can take the whole sky and map it onto like an oval. That's the picture you showed before. Right. Um, and you can see little dots of higher temperature and lower temperature in that map. Um, so when we look at that, we're basically seeing in the early universe that some parts of the universe were just a little bit hotter and some parts of the universe were just a little tiny bit colder. And those correspond to density fluctuations. So the parts that were um, a little bit hotter are, I think, a little bit higher density and vice versa. Right. And those density fluctuations can, uh, can grow over time. And so these were fluctuations in density at a part, one part in 100,000, but because gravity attracts um, that little fluctuation pulls in a little bit more matter um, as time goes on, and that pulls in more matter, and then that matter comes together, and you get galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and the whole structure of the cosmos. And, us, us. and we come around eventually 14 billion yeah. years later, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, one thing to note is that this, the CMB, as we measure it, is from a time that was only 380,000 years after sort of the time began, basically, as far right. as we can tell. Um, and so there's been a lot of time for those fluctuations to grow since then. The universe is now about 13.8 billion years old. Um, and so each of those little fluctuations, we want, if we look at that, we can tell something about sort of the origins of everything, the origins of all life in the universe, all structure in the cosmos, um, galaxies and clusters, and how it all began. And we can learn a lot about what the universe is made of as well. So with, what, what's it all made of? Is, well, it, is, um, it, is it made of, like, you know, spaghetti? No. Um, do, you, uh, do you have that pie chart? Do you want to... No, you were sharing it. You have the pie gonna, chart. Okay, I have a pie chart. Okay, so... Okay, so Okay, so we sent out a, a satellite called the Planck satellite. I have that because it is pretty. Yeah, let me um, pull that up. Okay. There we go. So let me share the pretty, pretty Planck because ESA is amazing. It makes a, just brilliant uh, imagery. So yeah. 
There's so that's, that's Planck. Yeah, that's a picture of the Planck satellite, which is out uh, very far away um, in space, and it's measuring this cosmic microwave background. Um, it has to get it has to get out far from Earth and far from the, you know it, sort of on the other side of, of Earth from the Sun to try and like stay cool. And because it's trying to measure this really, really tiny bit of radiation, it's a tiny temperature. Right. And so it's out there, and it's measuring this cosmic microwave background. It makes a beautiful map um, of mm -hmm. the cosmic microwave background. And by looking at how, basically, how those little dots are distributed, you can learn something about what the universe is made of. And I'll show you, um, let me just show you that pie chart. So it came out with a nice little pie chart um, of what is in... Uh, what is in the universe by looking at just those fluctuations in it's that background. It's made of pie. Mm. Yeah, so the universe is made of dark matter, dark energy, and ordinary matter, where by ordinary matter, I, I'm including like atoms and protons and electrons and all of the particles we've been able to sort of see and interact with. Um, right. Even obscure stuff you can make in laboratories or neutrinos, which are really hard to detect, all that stuff. Ordinary matter um, is only about five percent of the universe, and then about twenty-seven-ish percent. Which just yeah. makes you feel like okay, when you talk about feeling insignificant anyway. You know, we are this tiny little, yeah. we're these tiny little people on this tiny little rock floating around uh, an ordinary star and a lovely spiral galaxy among countless galaxies, and all yeah. this stuff, all of it, is less than 5% of the actual universe. Yeah, there, there's yeah. 95.1% of stuff that we don't, like, we can kind of observe or observe the effects of, but we yes. don't directly interact with more than 95% of the universe. That's just... Yeah. To me. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty mind-blowing. So, you know... Yeah, so by looking at those fluctuations, we can see what the universe is made of. Um, and how we do that is a little bit complicated. Uh, the main tool that we have to, to do that is through looking at the statistics of how those little dots are distributed. So can you bring up that, that map again of the uh, fluctuations in the CMB? Uh, the one that moves? No. The, the one I had the, up before. Yes. Yeah, and then I'll show you, and then we can do the, the one that moves. <laughs> I like the one that moves, too. The one that moves is pretty. Okay. Let's uh, do this one first. All right, so here we go. Okay. So here we go. This is C. Yeah, okay. And so this, this is, is from, a picture. This is from Planck. So yeah. this is what 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 one Planck or Plunk, because it's, it's Max Plunk, uh, is out there. This is what it gave back to us. Yeah, so this is its map of all the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave right background. And this is the whole sky, I should point out. This is, uh, you kind of unwrap the whole sky, which is a sphere, and you put it onto, you map it onto this oval. So in this, in this projection, the center of that picture is the center of the galaxy, uh, and the galaxy kind of stretches across horizontally. Um, and so if, you, if you're looking that direction, you're looking toward the center of the galaxy. If you're looking the opposite direction, you're looking at like the edges of that picture. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so you can see on this, this uh, picture that there are a bunch of little tiny spots, and there's kind of more of the tiny little spots than there are sort of larger blotches, I guess. Right. Um, so do you have that? Can you show that animation there? Because that's kind of cool. The, the, the pretty one? The one yeah. I really like? Yeah. So let me yeah. pull that one up. This one's really cool. There we go. Okay, so basically we take that whole map and we can break it down and look at the fluctuations on different scales. Uh, so this animation is showing basically the strength, like how many how many dots there are at each size. Um, the L on the bottom of that of that picture is something called the multipole moment, but it's it's basically a, a proxy for the the angle on the sky. So on the left hand side it's the large angles on the sky and you can see that as that, that thing sweeps across you're looking at big splotches and then you go to smaller and smaller splotches. And um, that curve is basically showing how much um, like how much of the map can be broken down into 
really large splotches versus really tiny splotches. Right. And so, and that and that curve, the shape of that curve, depends on what kind of mix of stuff is in the universe. Like whether you have a lot of dark matter or whether you have a lot of regular matter. Do you have um, that website that I was showing you with the uh, animations of how that curve changes with different uh, as a matter of fact, I have that exact animation right okay. here. Okay, yeah. So so this is... Um, can you click on the one that's the dark matter density? Maybe, if I can find it okay. again. If I was okay. looking at other things. Ah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, all right, well what this animation is is this is from older data, but this is showing that same thing, the amount of like the amount of dots at each at each scale mm -hmm. and how it changes when you change the mix of what's in the universe and how the universe has evolved over time. And so this top plot is that sort of wiggly um, you know, wiggly line. Um, and if you change the amount of stuff in the universe, uh, so this the, the stuff along the right-hand side of the, um, that figure is talking about how much the universe is curved and how much dark energy there is and how many baryons there are, like baryons being regular matter, um, right. how many how much dark matter there is. And as you change each of those things, you get different... Um, you get a different sort of... Yeah, you get a different kind of uh, curve. Yeah, so that's so this one is changing the the curvature, so how how flat the universe is, and right. then you can you can change things like how much dark matter there is, and that the distribution of dots on the sky changes as you change each of those things. And so now, I'll put the link to this uh, in both YouTube and onto the the Google Plus event because it it's really cool to be able to play into and and you get a brief description of what's going on there yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. So I'm going to share something um, real quick also. Okay. Uh, if I can find it. Find it. Um, yeah. So this is this is what what that plot looks like for right. uh, what Planck saw. Mm -hmm. And so you can see angular scale is along the top, and there's that big peak at about one degree, which is kind of where you see most of the little dots in that in that uh, Planck figure. Mm -hmm. And then those two, the, then you have a bunch of other uh, fluctuations. And the really striking thing about this, I mean, you don't have to understand exactly what it's showing, but the really striking thing is the agreement between the theory and the observation. Um, so the the green line is the theory, is the um, is sort of taking our understanding of what the universe is made of and how it evolved over time. Um, so this is like doing the calculations. Like this is yeah. what what. You know, by just doing the the maths, this is mm -hmm. what we're expecting to find, and then yeah. what we're seeing in the, the the red dots plus the error bars is what we're actually yeah. observing. Yeah. So the red dots uh, represent measurements, and the error bars represent the lines coming out of the dots represent how sure we are of those measurements. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it's just fantastic agreement. You can really see each of those little little peaks, and it's we really un we have a really good understanding of what the universe is made of just from trying to match what we see in the fluctuations on the cosmic ray background with what we can calculate in in our computers basically so, so is, is there a reason why you know towards the origin of this mm -hmm. plane why your our error bars are just all over the place is there a reason especially yeah. in the, compared to the rest of the curve which are pretty spot on we're seeing yeah. towards the the bottom left here, towards the origin, that it it there, first of all the there's a large range in our prediction, yeah. But there's also a, a large fluctuation as far as the the allow the error in our in our measurements. Is there a reason for that, or what's the explanation for that? Yeah, the reason is that um, those are really large angular scales on the sky. So that's when you're looking at basically the entire, like half the sky, for instance, mm -hmm. or like a quarter of the sky. And part of the error on that is that, me, part of the error on that is that we just don't have there. There aren't that many halves of the sky to look at that are like independent. <laughs> like we can look at each half of the sky 
and get some number, but we don't know like how much of the number that we get is just that we happen to be in this part of the universe, and if we were somewhere else in the universe, it would right. be very slightly different. Okay. And that's called causal variance. Right. And so it's, there's there's some uh, there's, there's there's some fundamental limit on what we can know just because we don't have very many samples of the whole sky at those kinds of angular scales. Right. Then there's also like and then and then the then we know in the theory that there's that kind of uncertainty and that accounts for part of that sort of swath of mm -hmm. of the green region for the theory. Um, and so we have we have much better error bars on the lower scale or the smaller scales. Um, where we can we can do many 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 samples of a region of the sky of that size, right? Um, and then kind of average them together and see what we find. Yeah, so that, I mean it kind of makes sense there. When you're going to have that that error there, so it's like saying, if I'm looking out in in my my flat in Los Angeles and trying to measure what temperature is like for the rest of the world the error variance is going to be huge because there are many different places and it's going to fluctuate. I will be right some of the time because yeah. sometimes other places will have similar temperatures, but since we are only able to measure from one part of the universe and there's many places in the universe and it's getting bigger because it's expanding yeah. and accelerating away from us. So, yeah, that that makes sense that, you know, you're, the larger the area we're trying to predict, it's going to be more difficult to actually get a, a more accurate. But the tinier spot, it seems like that we've got down pretty well. Yeah, yeah. And and the, then that's limited by the resolution of the measurement. So um, right. how how small a spot the the instrument can reliably measure. And that's mm. been something that's been getting better over time. Um, and got a lot better with the Planck satellite than with earlier satellites. But anyway, so we, we can learn a lot, and it looks kind of technical, but the point is that just by looking at how the temperature of this this afterglow of the Big Bang varies in different parts of the sky, mm -hmm. we can learn what's the universe is made of, and we can learn things about how it evolved over time. We can learn things about the process of cosmic inflation, which is the time when the universe went from being like a tiny... like it, When it went when it suddenly expanded very, very quickly over a very short amount of time in the first tiny, tiny fraction of a second. I think it's like a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, something like that. I, um, so, and and that's, that's the inflationary period that we're yeah. talking about. Where, like, the, it's so infinitesimally small yeah. that it's so even... It, I mean, it's hard for us to even comprehend. Cause that, I mean, that's, that's a number so small that... Yeah. And it's and it's doing what? Like, what are we talking about when it's infl having this inflationary period? Do we have an idea as far as the scale of how much? Well, yeah. So it expanded by. So we count it in e foldings, which is where the universe gets bigger by a factor of e, and e is this number that we use in mathematics for not, for a lot of different things. Right. I don't even remember what. E is at the moment, which is a little bit embarrassing. Um, it's somewhere around two. Yeah, but... it's around two. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean, you can go pull my calc book out and really find it for yeah. you. But it's. But yeah. so you're talking that, the, you know, it's a, it's growing at this huge, huge rate at yeah. this tiniest, tiniest fraction. Of time. Yeah. So so there was there was a tiny fraction of time. E is two point seven something. There you go. I just looked up. Um, the so it it went up by sixty e foldings, at least in this tiny fraction of a second. Whereas sixty e foldings mean it's it, it increased in size by a factor of e, um, at least sixty times, which ends up being quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, yes. It gets a lot bigger. Um, so the so we know that it expanded exponentially over a very very short period of time, or we think I mean if inflation happened, this is what happened: expanded exponentially over a very short period of time, and uh, and in during that process of expansion, 
there, that's where these little fluctuations come from. So that the, those tiny fluctuations, one part in 100,000, in the temperature of the universe um, at the sort of at that moment of 380,000 years after the Big Bang, those little fluctuations in density come from quantum processes that happened during this period of inflation. This, as far as we understand, that's that's how it happened. Right. We could talk forever about inflation, and, and we and we will at a different we time. We will at some point. Yeah, we're yeah. we're even uh, running out of time tonight because this is what we do. Yeah. So yes. it, and I think that's a good thing because it allows us to really break down things um, into smaller bites so we can go through and process them and dig deeper. And I, I have some questions that are coming up here on the okay. Q&A that I do want to address. Um, and one of them is, which I, I think is actually a, a good question for as far as understanding it, is so how do we know how far the CMB is? How do we know how far right. that, that that edge is? And this is from Michael Jobin. Yeah. Hi, Michael. So the 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 CMB, um, like as I said, as you look farther away, you're looking farther back in time, mm -hmm. and we're looking at almost well more than 13 billion uh, years back in time. Light takes. You know, one it, it travels a, a, one light year in a year. That's that's how fast light goes. Right. Um, so you would think that if we're looking back to 13 billion years ago, uh, we're looking at 13 billion light years away, which is not actually true. Not um, true at all. Weirdly enough, it is not true. Um, and the reason that it's not true is because okay, <laughs> the, the universe is expanding. So there's some surface out to which we can see, right? Right. Um, as so, let's say that you know at some point, something a certain distance away um, lets out a photon of light, and that photon starts traveling toward us, right? Mm -hmm. and it's, it's so. Let's say something's over here, and this little photon is starting to travel toward us, um, and that photon is moving at the speed of light. Um, as the universe expands, the photon starts traveling, but then the universe starts expanding, and so by the time the photon gets to us from that point the thing that let it out is a lot farther away. Um, right. And so, actually, the edge of the observable universe, the, the farthest out we can see because of how long it takes light to travel from there to us, um, is more like 46 billion light years away. And that's just the radius. So, so, uh, it, yeah. and so <laughs> that's in every direction because yeah, of this yeah. accelerated expansion. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's it's awesome and mind blowing to even think about that. Not only is you know light has a speed limit; it can only go so fast. But as it's yeah. trying to travel through space over this period of time that we know exists, space itself has been expanding, and so it's like you're trying to get there, and someone's like dangling the carrot, not only right <laughs> in front of you, but further away from you, and you can't speed yeah. up ever. That's what's going on. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some really cool implications of all that that we can talk about another time. But the the point is that the CMB is farther away uh, than you would think, based yeah. on just you know how how long it takes the light to get here from there. Uh, here's a, a another question here from the Q and A app, and I think we're going yeah. to get into this in an, uh, a future episode. But I do want to at least bring it up here. This is from uh, I. It's Masood Haruni. I hope I pronounced that right. It says, "How do you know that dark energy was not involved in the fluctuations?" Right. Um, so, so we, from what we can tell, dark energy was not an important component of the universe until about five billion years ago. Mm -hmm. um, something, some, somewhere around five billion years ago. It was not sig a significant component of the universe when the cosmic microwave background was, was produced. The reason for that is that, as far as we can tell, the density of dark matter, sorry, the density of dark energy stays the same as time carries on. Um, as the universe expands, the density of dark energy stays the same, which is weird, because normally if you have a box and you have stuff in that box and you make that box twice as big, the density is now half as much because you have the same amount of stuff in that box, and the box is twice as big. 
with dark energy, that doesn't happen. You have a box of dark energy, you make the box twice as big, now you have twice as much dark energy. Um, because the density stays the same. Right. This is weird. This is a very weird thing about dark energy. Um, but the point is that matter and regular energy don't do that. So um, at, at the time of the cosmic microwave background being emitted, there was a lot of matter and a lot of, like, you know, photons, a lot of light. And that, that was way more dense than dark energy. But as time has passed, the universe has expanded, and the amount of the density of matter and, and the density of energy, regular energy, has gone down. Mm -hmm. And now dark energy dominates. Dark energy is most of the energy density in the universe. But at the time, it wasn't. It was a tiny amount because the rest of everything else was so dense uh, right. that it just right. really, um, dominated um, dark energy. So there, we, yeah. <laughs> so we can see evidence. For dark energy, in like, in like the shape of the fluctuations on the CMB, only because we because of the way the universe has expanded since the CMB was emitted, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem to have played any role in the creation of those fluctuations. Got it. That's that's a great question. Thank you, Masood, for that. Uh, I'm gonna do one more. Uh, this one's actually okay. I, I'm going to say fairly easy. Um, and again, this is from Masood, so I'm going to... Masood, you get two in a row. Go for you. Uh, is this, can you tell the location of the Big Bang Theory? Well, I, I think you mean where the Big Bang happened, and I yeah. can kind of answer that uh, as having done that in some of the intro astronomy classes I've taught, is that everywhere. It was space right itself. It's there, yeah. it's there, it's everything was compressed Everybody's. down. So all of the three dimensions that we live in was in one spot. That is what, when we're talking well, about the Big Bang, is those those dimensions themselves, right? Well, I mean, if you're talking about the singularity, yeah, you can say that everything was in a, a single point, sort of. But you don't have to do that. The Big Bang Theory, the way we talk about the Big Bang Theory, we just mean the universe was hotter and denser and smaller. Everywhere in the universe was hotter and denser and smaller. Any two points in the universe were closer together at the time of the Big Bang. Right. Like, theory, the hot Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And you could have a universe that's infinite in extent and was always infinite in extent, but was less infinite in extent <laughs> um, at the at the time, and there is no center. There is no like right, point right. from which everything is expanding. Everything is moving away from everything else. Every part of the universe is expanding equally, as far as we can tell. And every part of the universe was smaller and hotter and denser at the beginning. Everything was closer to everything else. Right. And there's not we we talk about it as though there's like a, a ball <laughs> that's got that's smaller and got bigger. Not like that at all. The the whole universe, you know. Can can kind of expand or or have or was smaller. Um, basically, any you can kind of think about it like the density of the universe is changing over time, and the density was a lot higher everywhere. Everywhere, um, right? In the past. So there is no, as far as we can tell, there is no center. Um, one of the ways people explain it is they say like, let's say you have a balloon. And you have like the balloons all crumpled up, and then you blow up the balloon, right. and points on the surface of the balloon get farther apart. But there's no like no point on the surface of the balloon is the center of the balloon, because right. the center of the balloon is like some in some other dimension. You can say, and and you can kind of think about that for the universe, but it doesn't map perfectly. Right. But, yeah, and there is no center. There is no center because. Yeah. I mean, and for for us looking out, we can see things in radii because that that's how we look. We see things in these three dimensions. We're looking out, so it looks like a spherish thing to us because we have an observable universe. But we're from one point. We have one perspective, and that's it. I mean, the observable, the center of the observable universe is wherever you're observing from. Right. So, and which because, because the observable universe is defined by like how long it takes light to travel from distant places to you. Right. And um, wherever you are, there's a sphere centered on you <laughs> that defines the observable universe. I'm always the center of the universe. I mean, I thought everybody so, yeah. I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, you're, you're the center of your universe. You're not the center of my universe. 
Katie, what? <laughs> what? Oh, don't break my heart, please. Sorry, dude. Sorry. Oh, man. Well, okay, so I there are a, a few more questions. I'm going to write them down and get them ready for our next episode, which will be coming in two weeks. Um, and I think we have agreed upon a our that we can announce it too. Is that next week, next Friday, Saturday, is when our super secret uh, project is being released? First episode. Um, yes. Possibly. Um. Okay. <laughs> so. Something Quite may possibly. happen next weekend, yes. or it may not. Huh. You'll have to stay tuned for more. Yes. Um, yes. So what you can do in the meantime is, as we're doing more and more uh, outreach all over the place, uh, go ahead and, Katie, where, where can people find you and all of your amazing SciComm science community? Uh. You can find me on Twitter. That's where I usually hang out. Um, I'm at AstroKatie on Twitter. Uh, I'm also on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash AstroKatie, and I'm on Google Plus at plus Katie Mac. Um, and you can go and find more about my various things on my webpage at AstroKatie.com. Nice. And you can find me... I am at Scientific Scott right down here. Uh, Google Plus is my my main place, so you can find me at google.com slash plus Scott Lewis. I'm also on Facebook at, I think, Real Scott Lewis is my name on there. Uh, but let's see, coming up next is Thursday. So not only do I do things here at Another Cosmos, but um, we have our Hubble Hangouts. So with the Hubble Space Telescope, we have our weekly Hangouts. They are at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. So uh, head on over to all the things Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, we're partnered up there with Know the Cosmos and Hubble, and to bring you, like, awesome, awesome science. We just finished our first part of the history of the Hubble Space Telescope as we're coming up on the 25th anniversary, and there's just much more to come, so really excited about that. Uh, I do want to thank you uh, all for watching. Your great questions and comments. I'm seeing some come up on Twitter, and I will have to get to them later. Uh, so subscribe for more. Follow us all over the place, and we will see you in two weeks for yes. more CMB inflation -ish stuff ish. Yeah. Yeah, more on more on the the hot big bang and what what we know about it. That's right. Awesome. We will see you guys later. Bye.